Thank you so much, everyone. Welcome to Chopsticks Alley Talk today. And we really want to uh, thank <coughs> EJ Villanueva for his incredible performance of Miss Independent. Um, and of course, it's totally appropriate to open today's talk show or Art Tongue program um, honoring women. And um, Esther Young is my co-host. My name is Trami Crone. I am the executive director for Chopsticks Alley. And Esther is going to help me with today's show by producing it and also doing some background magic that she does for us. Hi, Esther. Hello, everyone. Great to have you all here today. And thank you, EJ. We're going to chat with EJ a little bit later. So, um, yeah, you get to stick around, though. <laughs> all right, we'll, we'll do. Uh, thank you for having me. And I'll, I will uh, kind of just hang out in the back and let you guys take care of the show. Very good. Thank you. So Art Tongue is a little lecture series where we bring to light interesting topics and perspective from the Asian art and culture. So we want to, to thank all of you for joining today. And I recognize some names um, from folks from the past. Um, and we really appreciate you for coming back. Hi, Jessica. And um, all these different, oh, Smita, hello, and Steve. And um, you know, you're also, all of this is being aired on um, channel 
30, Comcast Channel 30. So um, without further ado, I think I really want to introduce a very important character, man, leader in our community. And that is a state assembly Kara. member, Ash Kara, who is going to be saying a few words before we pre begin our program. Well, Trami, thank you so much. Thank you, Esther, uh, for inviting me. Um, and you know, I'm I'm, it's, I'm getting used to this new way of interacting with one another. But I, the good thing is that uh, we haven't stopped, right? Like we continue to do what we can. I appreciate Chopsticks Alley for continuing to do the great work they've been doing for so many years. And uh, you know, it, it's interesting because there were so many events planned this year earlier in the year to mark the 100 year anniversary uh, of, of the women's right to vote. And I know that because understandably of what's been happening with the pandemic, and obviously with the, the resurgence of the black liberation movement with Black Lives Matter, it's, it's, it's confusing to be able to, under, to talk about these issues as they're all kind of intersecting. But I do think that there's a natural connection um, with women's suffrage and um, with the black liberation movement. Now we do know um, that when women were given the right to vote, it wasn't all women. We also know uh, that um, it, it took many, many years. In fact, when women's suffrage occurred, those that were immigrants from India and many other Asian countries weren't also allowed to become citizens. Um, but that being said, many that were part of the abolitionist movement and many really profound black leaders were very much in support of women's suffrage, including Sojourner Truth, Frederick Douglass, so many others that are these monumental figures that understood that we couldn't be free until everyone was free, that until everyone had the right to vote and had their voice heard, that, it, it, that we were not, that we were all minimized because of it. And we're seeing that now with the Black Lives Matter movement, you're seeing multi-generational, multi-ethnic folks are out in the street standing with our black sisters and brothers. And interestingly, if you, if you really pay attention, you'll see it's black women that are really taking the lead in this movement. And we've seen far too many black mothers that have been crying uh, because of the loss of their children, the loss of their sons, um, because of the loss of their partners. Uh, and then on top of that, we still haven't had justice for Breonna Taylor. This is all relevant when we talk about the arts, we talk about the intersectionality of our cultures and our communities, especially as immigrants. And if you look at Minneapolis, many of the black women and men that were out there were Somali refugees, those that have experienced um, so much pain and suffering in their lives and are standing up once again um, against a, a lot of the pain and suffering that have been occurring uh, against our black sisters and brothers. And so I, I think that this is, you know, when we talk about the role of the arts, the role of culture, of music, you can look at the civil rights movement, you can look at every major movement and the arts played a significant role in it, uh, whether it was visual arts, whether it was poetry, music. And so I think that as a community and particularly as API community, if we wanna see how we can be allies uh, in the Black Lives Matter movement, if we can see how we, how we can speak up in terms of COVID and the pandemic response, both in terms of the racism towards so many of the API community, as well as the fact that you know, the black community is suffering the most um, and it speaks to healthcare justice issues as well and racism in our healthcare system and our education system, our economic system. There's plenty of opportunities for us to use the arts and to use our voice in a very powerful way for, to, to unify and to, to show solidarity together. And so um, I, I appreciate the fact that this conversation is happening, that these conversations continue to happen and to see how we can take action to back up some of the words of solidarity that we're putting forward. And so I just wanna thank all of you for, for continuing to be part of this. Um, and of course, starting off with EJ and with music, I think is the perfect way to talk about how we could be in solidarity through the arts. Thank you, Ash, for those words. And you know, I think next time we should have you come in as a DJ, because you used to <laughs> DJ yourself. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm down. Right? I mean, much more interesting than a politician. I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> and what are you wearing then? What kind of shirt are you wearing? You should sh so show it off. I have a Black Lives Matter. Let me pan down a little bit. But it's a Black Lives mm -hmm. Matter to public defenders. And so I was a public defender for um, about 11 years before I got into elected office. And uh, just two, three weeks ago, I was with the Sacramento Public Defender's Office uh, and I was wearing this shirt 
as the public defenders, of course, are on the front lines in terms of criminal justice system and see the, the, the racism that is, is systemic to our criminal justice system. So I was there standing with my uh, public defender brothers and sisters as they were you know, standing with Black Lives Matter. So yeah, thank you. To do I can. <laughs> thank you so much. So now um, we're going to invite you to relax, State Assembly member, and we're going to continue with the show here with Esther Young, who's going to be reviewing a little bit of the uh, history of women's suffrages. So go for it, Esther. Thank you, Chami, and I'm going to share my screen for you all. Um, and it's my honor to present a little bit of the history um, that had us name this event Year of the Woman. Here's the backstory. So I'm going to take you all back to the year of 1913. By 1913 in America, women had already been campaigning for decades for the right to vote. They had achieved no major victories since 1896 when Utah and Idaho enfranchised women. So that means a total of four states only were allowed to vote. And this lady you see here in the flowing white cape and the white horse like out of a fairy tale, her name is Inez Milholland. She's an activist and she was writing at the very front of the women's suffrage parade in 1913. And this parade that we're gonna focus on today uh, is the first, was the first mass protest for a woman's right to vote on the national scale. And this parade was organized by a woman, oops, a woman named Alice Paul. She was inspired by the British suffragettes who went on hunger strikes and uh, endured imprisonment in the early 1900s. And as a member of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, she called for this massive pageant. The Washington authorities initially rejected the plan, but she managed to get the decision overturned. And then she managed to confirm this parade for the day right before President Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. And this way, the parade would get maximum media coverage. However, an ugly truth is that Alice Paul herself also suffered from the disease of racism. She mainly focused on appealing to white women of different backgrounds, and she discouraged African-American activists and organizations from participating. If they did participate, she would ask them to march in the back. But some of them did no such thing. This on the left you see here, this is Ida B. Wells Barnett. And she was an investigative journalist and an anti-lynching advocate. She refused to move to the back and she proudly marched under the Illinois banner. And on the right here is the co-founder of the NAACP. Uh, that is Mary Church Terrells and she also joined the parade. And this parade was a very powerful exhibition. They had international suffragists, uh, they had artists, performers, business owners. They had parade floats in the form of golden chariots. They had an enormous Liberty Bell float and also a map of the countries where the women could vote. And then on the steps of the treasury building, a live orchestra played as performers acted out the historical achievements of women. They continued to march even when a mob blocked the route, uh, basically a bunch of men hurling insults and spitting at the women, uh, tossing their cigars and physically assaulting them. The police did not intervene and in the end over 100 women were hospitalized. Um, their mistreatment was widely reported throughout the country, which brought the parade into the greater public eye and also garnered more sympathy for them. Uh, national newspapers lambasted the police for doing nothing. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> and congressional hearings also investigated their actions during the parade. Uh, as for Inez Milholland, the lady on the white horse, she continued to campaign throughout the United States despite suffering from chronic health problems. And in 1916, when she collapsed giving a suffrage speech, it was reported that her last words were, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? In 1920, her dying wish was granted when Congress ratified the 19th Amendment, finally granting women the right to vote. And 100 years later, this brings us to 2020. However, we know that this right did not really extend to all women. In much of the country, there were hurdles such as poll taxes and literacy tests 
and these were designed to keep Black voters disenfranchised until the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, and this outlawed discriminatory voting practices. So this ongoing struggle for women all over the world is what inspires the art series that we are presenting today. Wonderful, thank you so much, Esther. And um, we would like to inform you, I guess, we, though we are celebrating the centennial and women, we are also um, wanting to bring to you awareness of issues that women are still facing today. And the best person to do that for us is going to be our invited guest, artist Hadi Agi. And I'm gonna read a little bit of his bio for you so you get to know who the man is. And if you notice, we um, invited men to uh, be a part of the event to show today. And the reason is because we want men to celebrate us <laughs> as women. So they didn't know that. So there it is. Surprise, surprise. Oh, we know that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let me introduce artist um, Hadi Agi. So he is a self-taught artist. He has been absent from the art scene for nearly three and a half decades. From the encouragement of his artist friend, Johanna Amirat, he returned a few years ago to pick up where he had left. So just a few years ago. He experimented with various styles of subjects to preserve the memory and elegance of the past. Hadi attended Evergreen Valley and Mission College to improve his skills, and more importantly, to learn how to navigate the world of art in America. By learning about art enthusiasts and what they expect, and also what to expect from not only the artwork, but also from artists. So unfortunately, he was not too happy with his findings. Welcome to the real world. <laughs> <laughs> um, he still felt, however, inside that he was obligated to use his art and continue his art to bring light to social issues and the current state of humanity and inhumanity. So besides acrylics and oils, which is what you'll see today, Hadi also experiments with digital painting and small scale sculptures. He is now a full time artist actively exhibiting his works and participating in local, regional and national juried art shows and has received many awards. Um, so welcome Hadi Agi. We're so excited to have you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Uh, thank you for the invite. And uh, yes, uh, as uh, I see many artists celebrate the achievement of women. And I very much appreciate that for what they do. But I picked up the dirty work. <laughs> I, I said, I'm going to talk about the issues that still left and need pay, to pay attention to. So that's where this series of my work is concentrated on. Wonderful. And and we're going to have Esther um, play the slideshow. And we also welcome audience questions. So you're welcome to type them into the chat. We'll post. Before, yes. before we start, I just want to thank Mr. Uh, Clara for being on the right side of the issues uh, for, for this country and for us. Yeah. That's very important to say for sure. Um, thank you, Ash, for joining us. And um, oh, so everyone, uh, you're welcome to type in the chat. Your questions will most likely call on you because we have a smaller group today. Um, so that way you can ask your questions yourself and we wanna see your lovely face as well. So here we go, take it away, Hadi. So the title of your um, <laughs> series is called God's Second Mistake. Hmm, um, I, I, feel like, <laughs> I feel like we need music like tung tung tung. <laughs> I don't know if I should explain that, except that my story is about uh, how the men have treated women from the beginning. So can we leave it at that? Because I don't want to offend. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> so be before I start, I want to point out a few things. Uh, uh, even though most of my work is talking about how men has treated women. I'm not here to condemn all men because not all men are evil, just like not all women are angels, you know. <laughs> so so uh, and, and secondly, 
most of my findings was uh, I found out that almost all the countries and regions I research for, their constitution or laws protects women, but absolutely no difference from one place to another. They all do the same thing. There is, I don't understand uh, the laws if it's not enforced. So that, that was the second thing I learned from my research. Uh, but this particular painting here is my take of what really happened. <laughs> uh, because from what we have seen men has done throughout the, t the time uh, to women, I could not believe the story of what they say about what happened in, uh, with Adam and Eve and why they were thrown out of the kingdom of God. <laughs> so uh, this is my take on it. I, it looks to me that he's the one who forced her to take a bite. <laughs> that, that's my take at it. So, uh, oh wow, this is a tough one. Uh, you know, sometimes I think people join some uh, rebellion or uh, join uh, demonstrations to say something that they don't mean, or they have no idea uh, what they're talking about. To me, the right to life, uh, I don't understand what they mean by life, because to me, these people are screaming that I am already here. I want to have a life and they should have more priority than the one that's not born. Uh, that's my take on this piece because I'm not suggesting that abortion is the right thing, but I'm saying those, who are, those kids who are alive should have more priority uh, to be taken care of. Uh, I want them to hear the cries of this little girl here or the hunger of this little boy the weight of these bricks on his on her head so uh, people are controlled by politicians and sometimes religious leaders to go out protest for something but actually for a different reason does it make sense Uh, this one happened, uh, I have a couple of paintings uh, that happened a few years ago because of the rise of Islamophobia. This one and the one behind me uh, with the lady behind the blind uh, is uh, the result of uh, the events that happened uh, for three, four years ago. Uh, the Muslim women then being harassed everywhere. But this one represents a person that doesn't know who to satisfy. At her home country, he's harassed by, because her hair is showing from the scarf. In the West, he's harassed for covering her hair with a scarf. So and this is called enigma of freedom and doesn't know who to satisfy. This is unfortunate, but this is something that happens. Oh, <laughs> um, when I did this series, because I was gonna do a global one and point out the problems from different regions of the world. I said, I better do my region first so nobody complain why you're picking at us. So I did this, this is the first one I did. And uh, uh, this just points out a few things. Uh, 
in certain situation in the court of law, one woman, one man is equal to two women when, as, as a witness. And I still haven't figured out what, why. It's, uh, I mean, Islam as a religion places women as the, at, the highest, at the highest place and all of a sudden this one thing in there and I wonder if they were interpreted by religious leaders or is it actually true because it doesn't make sense. Uh, double standard, men can do whatever they want to do, <laughs> you know, women, even they're going to the ocean for vacation, they go into the water with tons of clothing on there. It's, it, uh, here, uh, this lady is happy showing the paperwork because to leave the country by yourself, you have to have the permission from the parents or a male in your family. Otherwise, you cannot leave the country by yourself. And he's, she's showing how happy she is. She got permission. <laughs> um, parents, what we call here, helicopter parents, they really have a close watch on the female, uh, the daughters of themselves, uh, which is uh, almost, even if you are 25, 30 years old, but not married, they watch you <laughs> like a hawk. And this is very, uh, something that also bothers the, the girls there. In the bottom, I have the separation of genders in the public. When there's a gathering, there's almost a wall. No, they cannot mix. Uh, men are separated from each other, no matter if they're married or not married, wife or husband, ma, grandma, grandpa, you, they separate everybody. Uh, so, yeah, this is the story on Middle East. But for all my paintings, I realized that in every culture, the symbol of happiness, love, care is always a woman. Even in the Southeast Asia, the Buddha maybe may have been originally uh, a man, but when they make a statue of it, they, they make it look like a woman. So that's why most of all of my paintings, they have a figure in the background uh, that kind of ties everything together. Uh, this one, we in Persia, we don't have many uh, statues representing anything, but I found this one, which represents the river, the water. I put it there because um, I hope for freedom to flow like a water for all the women, pass through the cracks and everything. <laughs> and everybody will be as free as the man and as equal as the man. This is the one I, for this section. Uh, yeah, this same thing like for this figure here. Uh, and this one is on Southeast Asia. Uh, the problems most female uh, face is still. Uh, like I start with this one here, this section here uh, on Japan. I was very surprised when, before I do this research, I was thinking of Japan completely differently, being one of the most progressed countries for a while. But women cannot go as far as men. That's why I have two sets of steps here. As a professional, they can only go to a certain level and, and where the man can go all the way up, but the woman can still take this path. But after it passes this area, it goes up. She can only go up there and serve tea to the man. 
this one is uh, oops. Oh, this one is in Cambodia using the little their daughters as a supplement for income. And this is Thailand, of course, using women uh, for as a tourist attraction. Uh, this one represents the Latin America, uh, which is actually that's a part of the world that's very violent to our women physically, not just mentally. Uh, I have in this corner when the woman try to escape from the drug war, they face many traps in their path. They could be captured for sexual exploitation, for slavery. Uh, drug lords use them to pass drug to the, cross the border. Uh, many, many problems they face, but they still take the journey, hoping for freedom. Uh, this is like being taken for sexual slavery, the kidnapping of the woman in the border. Uh, this one is some, countries in the especially in the south america they have the restrict the restricted uh, abortion rules and they don't even care some of them don't even care for the life of the woman that they you cannot have an abortion and here on the stomach it says uh, not my choice it wasn't my choice to become pregnant so that's what it says here uh, here is shown machoism of the man and expecting to woman to be as holy as Holy Mary, submit to man. Uh, and as we know in the news, especially a year ago, just a year ago, women were in the streets uh, fighting against murdering of the woman. Too many women are being killed uh, in the peninsula of the uh, Europe, like. Uh, Spain, Argentina, in that area. So that's a problem. And I am hoping, I put a hope here from Holy Mary to send out peace to all these people here. China being such a big country, I, uh, he deserves its own painting. Uh, This one known as the, in the West, it's known as the, the Thousand Hand Buddha. Uh, and I thought each one of these people here can use a hand, helping hand from her. That's why I put her there. Uh, in this corner, I have a, a woman sitting alone because the, the labor laws in China is uh, for the blue color people, when you get age, age 50, you have to retire. That's the law. For white collar ones may go to 55 years. So even though they are able and capable, capable uh, they have to quit. Uh, in here I have uh, people advertising their daughter or their granddaughter in the city parks because they graduated, they are professional, but they are too old to find a suitor. So they advertise them in the park. Uh, here, a lady looking for a two job post, one for man, one for woman. F for the man, it just says men only apply. For the woman, they made requirements for physical attraction, <laughs> the age, uh, you know, a lot of things that uh, man doesn't have to face. Here is on the background is about the sign says me too. When, they, when it started to happen in China, they quickly stop it. Uh, in the bottom is a sweatshop. We know the story of all the sweatshops. So uh, on the top corner, you see this figure on the top. It could be this little one here in the red. The suicide rate in China rural area is the highest in the world. 
Uh, by the way, I took all my information and research. They come from United Nations data. So I didn't pick from social media. All of them come from the United Nations data. They tabulate every issue by country, by percentage, by population. So uh, those are the researches that I did. This one, this particular painting, when I was reading, I was crying behind the computer because of what I learned about widows in India, what they used to do to them. Uh, yeah, this one really, really made me cry. <laughs> I have to admit it uh, because a country that values this animal here as a sacred animal, they decide to throw their, their mother away if their husband dies. And that is very hard to understand, very, very hard to understand. Uh, you know, these practices are prob mostly going away in the urban area, but still in other parts of the country, they still practice this. This is the child bride. Uh, doesn't matter how old the guy is, they can marry, you know, very, very young, delicate child. And is still using women as a mule to carry loads of heavy loads while tending to a child. Uh, rape, uh, India has one of the highest rate of rape. And I, it actually happens to a lot of young, very young girls. I didn't have the heart to put a young face here, but I, uh, this represents the, ma the mass rape of a lady. Uh, yes, India is one of those listed on the countries with highest rape. But most of this happened in the same region to Pakistan, Afghanistan. Yeah, not just India. This is kind of like the Americas. So <laughs> it's a different story. In, in the West and in America, the biggest problem is sexualization of women. Um, like, there are other problems, of course, uh, you know, the, if you look closely at this bill, it's missing a piece of it, uh, representing they get paid less than men for the same job. And in, nine, in 2019, the uh, data shows the women get paid in, in this area, 84% of a man with the same skills. Here is a woman waiting patiently for uh, her case. These are all the rape kids sitting in warehouses that not seem important to look after, to, to, to take on. Here we see a man looking at the woman, but the woman you almost is a see-through. She's not wearing that. That's what he sees. No matter how successful a woman is, men always look at women for a different purpose. This is when a woman tried to break the ceiling, they're pushed down. We saw that with Hillary Clinton, you know, in the last election. Uh, this is interference of the government in reproductivity. Uh, they always, I don't know, a whole bunch of men with no woman, they decide women's productivity. <laughs> and the bottom is the school where they teach you how to disrespect men. How to only see woman as a piece of meat. Uh, that's <laughs> this is the way I look at it. There is no other purpose for that, for what's happening here. And the statue of, uh, sorry, 
uh, Lady Justice. Uh, I, got, I was inspired by the women's movement a couple of years ago that this hat become the, a symbol of their protest. So I took her, her hand and let them knit this hat. Oh, Africa. Um, Africa has its own problems. Uh, female genital mutilation, FMG. This is something that uh, you know many organizations trying to get rid of, but it's still happening. Uh, unfortunately, and there is a lot of uh, you know bad results at the end of each case because they are performed in uh, in places that's not sanitary, like in the kitchen or in the backyard, and very sad. Uh, not all of them are done in the hospital or anything. That's why most, a lot of kids lose their life. Uh, rape south. South Africa is also one of the top countries in the rape. That's why I have that here. Uh, spousal abuse, mortality rate, not only the child, but the mortality rate of the mothers are high in certain part of Africa. And women still at this age have to walk miles with the bring the load of water, you know, like countries like ours, this, they send tanks and, uh, you know, equipments for war, but they don't send them a truck. So they don't have to carry water on their head. So this is very sad too. And the symbol in the middle, in Western part of Africa, this is this is a symbol of unity. It's like a chain connected together. Uh, and I have a broken chair going toward every case here uh, so they can grab to it and unite to each other and fight for themselves. We can go to the next one, yeah. Oh, this one, how heartbreaking. This is as recent as 2018, I painted this for using rape as the uh, tool of uh, war, mass rape as a tool of war that soldiers use. And th in this case, it's about Burma or Myanmar, we call it now. Even though United Nations Security Council resolution 1820 calls that to be ended, they don't care. It still happens. They rape women. And there is, as a result, there is millions of refugees in the neighboring country because they all run, run away. And in this corner, I have a monk, a monk that's his aim is to make Myanmar free of Muslims. And that's why they're way, you know, waging war against the, against the Muslims. He's a monk, but that's his plan. That's his aim to get, make Myanmar free of Muslims. Sad, very sad. Uh, this is a hope, hope that eventually everything will be equal for male and female. And uh, in order to do that, women have to unite together all around the globe. And we have seen as they have begun to do that, it's a spread everywhere, but they should not let go. They should support one another until the, the last thread of control by man is broken. This is what this rope represents. This is the tight control of man over woman and they are being broken one at a time. And hopefully the last one will be broken and everything <laughs> will be equal.
Thank you so much, Hadi. Oh, that was in intense, <laughs> to say the least. Um, I, I but, I have, but I have to say, uh, for every region that I mentioned a few things, they exist in all the other countries too. But the, the level of frequencies are higher for certain things at certain regions. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist in one place. Like uh, I mentioned, rape in certain countries or certain regions is high, uh, but in Iran is low because the consequences are very high. You, you get hanged if you rape. So it's very low, but it exists. It doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Yeah. Thank you so much for um, <laughs> everyone's <laughs> face. is like so serious. Um, so I, I think um, we need the EJ's music now. <laughs> yes, right. So we, we need EJ's music to uh, soften but the intensity. Before that, if there is any question, yes. Yes, we actually have a question from Marcos Villa or Villa. He says, "What role do you think motherhood plays with all these issues women face?" Teaching their kids from the beginning what's right, what's wrong. I, I mean. You may, you may not face that when they grow up, but they know well. At least they themselves control themselves, the kids. Yeah, the teaching should be right from the beginning. Thank you. And do we have any questions from our Zoom audience where you would like to um, be on camera and ask your questions? Um, if not, we have another question for Esther um, early on. Esther, um, when you were doing your presentation, he's, um, do you remember that? Yeah, that question was actually directed towards Marco Villa for me, because um, he gave some really interesting comments on Facebook, and I just love to read a couple of them. I can um, scroll up here on the Facebook chat. He mentioned, um, he asked if was labor history part of an academic focus or were you taught this in general ed? So that's what I asked him. Originally, he had said, I love this history of women's suffrage. I learned about this <laughs> while studying labor history. Um, so I was wondering for Marcos if that was part of his academic focus, like in school training or if he was taught this in general ed. Um, but we do have some more interesting comments from our Facebook attendees. Um, Marcos again commented, he said, in my union, women get paid the same as men. Many men say that women aren't as strong as men, so why do they get paid the same? I tell them yes, but <laughs> women are smarter. <laughs> we have a question from uh, Smita. Would you like to um, ask the question yourself, Smita? We're going to unmute you. and uh, Sure. Um, let's see if... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I'm cooking in my kitchen while watching this. So, you know, women's lives, right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my question was, uh, how do you, <clears throat> what, sorry, my throat is giving up. I need to get a drink of water. Um, would you like me to read it for you? So her question was, uh, do you have any personal experience with this that you can share? So with all the issues you mentioned, do you have any personal experience that you witnessed? I don't have any personal experience. My only personal experience seeing around what's happening. I mean, as an artist, we are looking for things all around us all the time. And we see that. Uh, actually, this whole series started when some I saw read an article on uh, on internet, somebody come, somebody say how the women are treated in that part of the world where I come from. And that made me think about my own family, my mother, my sister, any woman in my life. Uh, is this really how they were treated? And it didn't sound right because it, it wasn't. So I said, let me compare my country or my region to the rest of the world and that's where this series all came about when i when i started reading i couldn't stop anymore i couldn't stop anymore i just kept going um smita also wants to know what pushed you in the direction of creating this work 
Oh, I think that's all. That's what I just mentioned. It's a, it was that article on the newspaper that prompted me to investigate and compare treatment of women from one region to another. Uh, and uh, it was actually an emotional journey reading all that for, for so long, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I think we've, we have a, few, a lot more comments, but you know, we do want to end on time because I know people have lives. Um, <laughs> so we're, we're waiting for EJ to be ready to, um, you know, present to us the, uh, his, his music. And so I, I'd like to think of EJ's music as his gift to all the women who joined today and all the women who are tuning in um, to celebrate us. And, and our hardship and what we've gone through. And we still have a lot to do. And we also like to thank the men who are on the show today who are showing solidarity. And that's absolutely so important. Um, you can see Hadi Agi's um, artwork and also EJ's um, information on, I think Esther's gonna share that last slide. Um, Hadi's artwork will be on exhibit at Evergreen Valley College in January of two, uh, 2021 along with Mark F. Erickson, Duan Toy, and Dr. the late Dr. Jerry Hiora's work in an um, exhibit called Fragments. It will be virtual, however, because of COVID. Otherwise, it would be in person. But we would like to um, encourage you to come and visit that exhibit in January. And also follow Chopsticks Alley everywhere. We're on Facebook, Instagram, et cetera. So that way, um, you can definitely see uh, what we're up to next. And we're always open to, to suggestions. So if you have topics you wanna to discuss, you wanna invite different guests, whatever it is, we would welcome it. Um, because for us, it's really to respond to what the community needs and to unite communities by sharing all these different perspectives. Is there anyone else in the Zoom audience who would like to ask a question? Um, otherwise, I think um, EJ might be ready to go. Huh? <laughs> Hello. You get, yes. So, oh, so EJ, why don't I read a little bit about him? Because poor guy, um, we need to like really spotlight him because he's incredible. He is, of course, a musician and a music educator who primarily plays woodwind instruments such as saxophone, as you heard, clarinet, flute, and most recently, EWI. I have no idea what that is, so he'll have to tell us. That is an EWI, in short, e -wee. electronic <laughs> wind instrument. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I've been educated. Thank you. And as an educator, as appropriately, um, he teaches TK fourth general music and fifth sixth instrumental music at Anaheim Elementary School District and also gives private lesson. Come on, ladies, you can sign up. Um, EJ has uh, been playing since the third grade, but his love for music did not really come into fruition into high school when he was was exposed to different types of music such as jazz rock funk classical sk latin etc he is the lead with the band experiment six and plays with stupid flanders los hijos desobedientes and formerly scadona the orange county degenerates and tandy and the larger picture ej is an accomplished woodwind musician who played chamber music postmodern music, jazz gigs, rock, and orchestra pit in the musical theater setting, you name it, he's done it. And he recently performed with American Idol runner-up Jessica Sanchez, along with the Santa Maria Band at the Envision Center in Van Nuys, where he played a counter melody role along with Jessica's beautiful melodic lines. EJ has, EJ has played at venues from Seattle all the way to New York City when he is touring with Los Hijos Desobedientes. So EJ, um, tell us a little bit about what inspires you to become a musician and did you have family support? Um, I'll, I'll answer the second question first. Um, as, a, as a Filipino American, uh, first generation, um, there are certain expectations that, um, that our um, parents would have on, upon us so like you know there's a certain expectation to go into like their medical field or or get into law or get into business um i wanted to break typical filipino conventions by going into music um because i feel like uh music well first of all it's very fun for me to do not to only perform but to also teach i find a lot of joy in it but also i find that music is 
um, I guess for lack of a better term, uh, something that like almost everybody can um, uh, understand and uh, kind of uh, embrace as a as an oral art that can resonate with people. So I wanted to make a difference in the world through the vehicle of music, through performance and education. Thank you. That's perfectly said. And what piece are you going to be performing for us today um, as we say goodbye to our audience? Um, this last piece will be uh, uh, this woman's work, originally uh, written by Kate Bush, but made uh, extremely popular by Maxwell. Thank you. And also, we'd like to thank our artist, Hadi Agi, for your incredible artwork. It was intense. Like, I feel like after this, I need like to watch Disney movies or something. <laughs> <laughs> right or or I don't know something a little bit softer, but I think um, EJ is gonna take us out with a softer melody. Did you have any last words for our audience, Hadi? Uh, thank you for the opportunity and thanks for them to tune in. Yeah, thank you. So, ladies, we celebrate you today. Um, this video will be on our Facebook page and also on YouTube, so it will you can continue to share it if you want. And we appreciate you for coming today and, and watching and learning. And uh, we want to celebrate women in 2020 despite all the craziness. All right, so have a good one. And EJ, take it away.
Thank you so much, EJ. Um, I mean, my goodness. Um, whew. <laughs> that was incredible. Um, so at this point, it is the end of our programming. Um, Esther is going to share the social media um, post there. But we uh, want to still keep the Zoom room open because I think um, many of us would like to discuss this further. <laughs> I think it's going to, it's, it's called group therapy. <laughs> at this point <laughs> and Hadi you're going to be our um <laughs> our psychologist I don't know <laughs> um EJ thank you so much for your beautiful music and also I want to uh, make a shout out to Amanda Pasquale your significant other it's because of her and me stalking her that's how I was able to find you so Amanda um I wish we could see you <laughs> Um, um, you're going to have to take yourself off of the sound, EJ, so we can hear you. Yeah. And also, if you'd like to support Chopsticks Alley, we've included a link there. Um, you can just do a little donation, and that's how we're able to continue with these programs. And we would welcome everyone to unmute themselves, so that way we can all chat with one another. <laughs> Uh, Natasha, I, I see you. Feel, I feel like you have so much to say when I watch your face as the show is going on. <laughs> She's a great artist. I know her. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I came to support Hadi over here and I am so enlightened. I, I, have, I hadn't seen all his work before and it's so intense and the narration, the composition, I mean, if you are transported in a place and it, if you look at his pain it's a dark place to be you can feel that that uh, that sorrow that uh, the things that these women are going through i don't know it's very very intense it's very intense uh, so we i would say we i come from a family which was i would say quite accepting and modern but we've been hearing these stories from everywhere in the world. And I have two girls. And a rape is something which is, which is very, I feel very frustrated and very angry listening to these stories. And I'm like, oh God, this should never, ever happen to anyone. And it still happens. Still Even happening, there are yeah. so many rules, laws. But I don't think that even the government is doing anything to prevent uh, these from I, happening and helping the women around. I'm, I found out it's all cultural. Mm -hmm. it's, in, it's been in the culture for thousands of years, no matter how many laws they pass. I know. It's just there. Men cannot just let go. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. also, it's, you know, it becomes a woman's job to explain her position when she is raped. That's the worst thing that she is looked down upon. Yeah, if they sometimes they blame the victim yeah. in certain parts of the world. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah it's sad. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I'm raising my hand. Yes. Hey, Rooster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Hadi, um, I, I believe you, you haven't done a piece about um, my faith, the, the Jewish faith, and, and I actually would be interested to see what you find. And, and I know, you know, coming from being born in the Jewish faith, that's a really touchy subject. I but have I have one painting done on Palestinian Israeli conflict. I but, would like to see that, but I would also uh, like to see what you yeah, find. Just, trying to get good lighting on my face. I've got a good yeah, it's, third We, we don't that. have any beef with Jews as a religion the no, highest it's, it's the highest concentration of the highest concentration of jews in the middle east after israel is in iran so it's a problem of the state not not the religion uh, well, and i don't know how to put that together on a on a painting I, i'll have yeah, to think that's, about it that's yeah. that's why i was asking you to yeah. do it because i yeah, personally I've, can't figure out how you would portray that on one single canvas because i know yeah. i know the prayer that in the morning men are supposed to say is, is, you know, thank God for making me a man and all you've 
give me and what the women say rough you know my half my family are orthodox jews and i love and respect them but what the women say is thank god for giving me another day to be alive and giving me a family so there is some you know, know. ranking see. that we're not exactly equal but there is still you know i don't actually know what goes on in different levels of you know higher belief in my faith so maybe you're the one who was supposed to do that no? but that's not my narrative Adi. you know my narrative it's a lot darker <laughs> We'll think of, I'll, I'll think of something. We'll, we'll collaborate. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like a good plan. Yeah, oh. a collaboration. <laughs> yeah. So um, do, do you, would you like any, to add anything, Andrew? Andrew Ha? Uh, I like the art that you guys presented, which was totally amazing. Uh, I had a quick question. Uh, have you guys ever done an art show about the Hong Kong protests and what's going on. I mean, I'm I'm Chinese American ABC, but I connect with that a lot, you know, and learning about all the Chinese values, Confucianism, uh, the all this stuff, you know, it's fascinating. There's so much uh, going on. We don't know which one to start with. <laughs> well, I was, uh, I've been drawing a lot of Black Lives Matter art huh. and connecting it with Hong Kong because uh, the the aftermath in terms of police, police brutality is very similar and uh, just like just almost everything like if you were to watch it you know side by side you can't even tell which is which these days you know? yeah, like, no no and you look at the pictures you, you don't know which one is which <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah no yeah, we have not sure. we have not done one yet with the Hong Kong protests um, yeah I was wanting to do something similar to what I have here for one of my pop-up exhibit ideas as I'm trying to open a museum of cookies to educate people on Chinese culture, you know, starting with the, the Chinese opera and then talking about the youth and their, and how they're rebelling against Chinese identity and, and stuff. Put, put, I don't know, put, just, just... put your camera a little lower. Cause this is intriguing to me. <laughs> this yeah, is, a, this was, I mean, the colors make me feel like this is the happy, happy sunshine moment. Well, uh, um, these but... are actually pagodas I drew that represent all four seasons uh yeah they're just minimalist pagodas you know frank stella style so <laughs> yeah <laughs> well maybe you should create the work and send it to us and maybe you know yeah i was thinking right? maybe we can do like a pop-up style type of exhibit and uh, we could give out like some chinese style cookies or <laughs> or bakery because that is my goal for museum of Moon cookies cake. <laughs> Well, mooncake's more for a uh, mid-autumn festival, but yeah, it's okay. <laughs> I'll take the mooncake any day. Like I, I know, it's a, my favorite. <laughs> I love egg tarts. <laughs> yeah, John Tart, that's too. <laughs> yep. So um, is there anything else anyone would like to say? Otherwise, you know, I actually was texting EJ. I'm like, can you play another song? And he says he will. So if you yeah, wanna... that sounds great, Ooh. right?